we know that we have a lot of our audience that was really into a reincarnation of spring football this year. We have been very open about our passion for the Alliance, the AAF. In fact, we're still simulating the end of the season. Tomorrow, your final episode of Alliance Primetime when it comes to the regular season to see how things wrapped up in the 2019 inaugural year, the only year of the AAF. And so we here on the show are a bit emotionally scarred. We have been broken up with. The AAF obviously is no longer. We don't know if we can jump back on the horse just yet. We've looked out the window, and it's rainy, it's cloudy. We're worried about having our heart scarred again. But there has been some overtures. There's been a new girl in the bar that's been flirting with us a little bit, and we want to at least give it some attention because we don't get flirted with often. That would be the XFL, which just denounced its newest head coach in the New York area. That would be former Giants offensive coordinator Kevin McC- Uh, Kevin Gilbride, who was part of the staff that won two Super Bowls with the New York Giants, and he's now going to be the head coach of the New York franchise in the XFL. The CEO of the XFL joins us in studio, Oliver Luck, and he has done everything in the sports world and now has taken over the reins of this brand new league, and he joins us here in studio. Oliver, good morning. How are we doing? Doing great, thanks. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not sure which metaphor to pick up on. I can show you a little bit of skin, maybe. (laughs) I can ask you to trust us. I can say the sun is rising, there's blue sky on the horizon. I'm not sure which one to pick up on, but let me tell you, we (laughs) want to embrace everybody that loves spring football because we love spring football. The timing was tough for us because we invested emotionally in the season. Absolutely. No, I, I make light of it a little bit. But we didn't even get through the regular season. <laughs> That's right. I was a fan. I was enjoying watching the games. You I were? Mean, yeah, absolutely. I thought the people that said the ali- the brand of football, the quality of football was not good, were disingenuous because I thought the brand of football actually was really good. I thought the football was good. Listen, Bill Polian is a very smart, successful football guy. I'm not sure there's anybody in the planet that knows more football than Bill does. And I thought the, the level of play was pretty good. I will say I thought the quarterback play could have been a little bit better, and I suppose that was a result of paying everybody the same, right, in our Sort of hierarchy quarterbacks are you know more important than everybody else, so we want to pay a little bit more for those guys. But I thought I thought overall, you're absolutely right. I thought it was a good quality of play, and I thought the games were fun. A lot of close, uh, competitive games. So in the XFL, unlike the AAF, there will be structure. There will be tiered salaries for different positions. Correct, with quarterbacks on top. That's the natural order of things. And what is, yeah, no question. <laughs> that, that's how the animal kingdom works. <laughs> how much will be the top tier of what XFL quarterbacks you make? So our top tier will be guys making two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. We can afford to pay a quarterback that amount of money based on, on our salary structures. And then as we go down, we get down to levels m- much like the AAF was. The biggest problem, obviously, with the alliance was not executing the games and the gameplay itself and having good players because a bunch of players ended up already on NFL practice squads and rosters in the offseason and in rosters and the XFL it was finances and so how do you how do you convince a new audience that you won't have the same financial issues that the alliance did well I think there's really uh, two things one is time and one is money and of course they're both you know interrelated so ultimately as you know as everybody knows Vince McMahon is the uh, the a force behind the XFL. And uh, Vince has made a very serious capital commitment because you need money in any startup, right? And particularly in, in sports, particularly in football, which is so logistically complex and, and at the end of the day, relatively expensive to launch. So Vince is committed uh, for certainly more than one year. And he's got budgets that have been put together for multiple years of of XFL football. And that's the reason I signed up. I think that's the reason many of our head coaches signed up, guys like Bob Stoops or Mark Tressman or Kevin Gilbride that uh, we'll announce just uh, shortly. So uh, those guys are all good quality people. They love football, but they also you know, want to make sure that it's a secure venture. And I think uh, based on what I've seen of, of Vince over the last seven, eight months uh, when I joined the company, uh, it's all very serious and he's ready, ready to go. So that money has given us the time to plan. And I think those are two things that are indispensable to any sort of a startup. And I think at the end of the day, the AAF kind of lurched a little bit too quickly into the business side of things. And of course, as you pointed out, you need both the football and the business side to work. Oliver Luck joins us from the XFL here in studio. Did the Alliance try to get ahead of you guys and launch a year early? 
You know, I, I'm not sure I can say why they launched when they did, but I think they did launch uh, too early and, in a sense, didn't have the, the, the time to prepare the, the business side. You've got to get broadcast partnerships, sponsors. You've got to get solid ticketing folks. you got to hire a bunch of people. I mean, it's a big you know enterprise. So I'm not sure why they launched when they did, but at the end of the day, I think they didn't give themselves enough time to get the business side set up. One of the stories out there was that their technology, specifically their app technology, was really futuristic and really valuable. Did you guys view it that way? I watched a number of games on my smartphone, and you know I'm not a gambler, so I can't really say too much about that. Uh, and of course, I live in a state where where there is no online sports wagering, so it would sort of uh, you know a moot point in a sense. Uh, I uh, you know can't really speak to how good their app is, quite honestly, because you know as I watched it, you know I, I watched the game. I really didn't pay attention to a lot of the sort of gizmos and and other functionalities of the app. So I'm not sure that, uh, you know, whether their app really was was as valuable as, as folks may have thought it would be. I mean, everybody in, it seemed, in the alliance thought it was going to be lasting at least three years. Their player contracts were three-year contracts. And when Tom Dundon pulled the plug in it, everybody said, this is impossible. Is there any fear for you that you've seen the projections and yet there could be always the unknown that you guys don't get through the first season? I highly doubt it. Never want to rule anything out, but I, I, I highly doubt it. I mean, Vince has gone through this before. He's a, a, a successful business person. I mean, and they've only be, made one season. That's, that's right. No, to be fair, you're right. They made one season, and then uh, both uh, the network at the time, NBC and, and WWE, you know, shut it down. Uh, but he's gone through this before. Uh, he's built a remarkable, successful company, WWE, with you know, 500 events a year around the country. I think he knows a lot more today than he did back in. 2001 with the old XFL. I think, quite honestly, our our football staff is is much more seasoned and experienced and understands this. I've gone through a football startup with NFL Europe for 10 years and sort of understand how that works. So it's it's possible, I suppose, but I think it's highly unlikely uh, that uh, we won't we won't see multiple years of of the XFL. My biggest concern with the XFL is that you guys decided to launch in cities that had NFL teams, and the Alliance decided the opposite. They went into places like San Antonio and Orlando, and places that are big enough to support football, but not big enough to have NFL teams. What was the decision making into getting into the big NFL cities? Sure. So uh, the, the the rationale is there are forty million diehard, passionate football fans, probably guys like you and I. <laughs> And those folks have a void in their lives come Super Bowl because there's no more football for an extended period of time. And we decided that in the larger markets, there's more of those passionate football fans. And, and I assume here in New York, we'll have, we'll have season ticket holders from the Jets and the Giants who support the XFL franchise in New York and season ticket holders for some of the colleges or folks that go to high school, but people that just love football. We think there's more of them in markets like New York and Houston and Dallas than there is in Memphis and Salt Lake City. So I think that's a, a significant difference in sort of the strategy that we had versus what the Alliance did. You guys say you were not happy to see the Alliance end. Is that right? That's correct. No, no dancing on the grave, no schadenfreude. Uh, it's a cautionary tale, quite honestly. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I was a fan as well. I knew a bunch of the players and a number of the coaches in the league and was rooting for certain guys. And uh, I was you know, chastened when uh, the announcement came that they shut down. So I respect you and I trust you, but I don't trust this. How would you guys have fleshed out another league full of rosters if they didn't fold? Because didn't they all have contracts that were exclusive that you could not have plucked AAF players? They had contracts where there was a uh, restriction on playing in any other spring league. Now, that's a, a, a legal clause that we believe would not have been upheld by a state court, right, because of the average professional football career is relatively short, less than four years, and restricting somebody's ability to play in another league, uh, we, we believe was a, you know, a violation of uh, the freedom to contract. So we never got to that point, right, because the league folded and now all these uh, you know, players are available for us, which, by the way, is a good thing for us. The player pool and the coaches pool. There's some pretty good coaches in that league. I got calls from Mike Singletary and Mike Riley and you know many other assistant coaches in that league. So the, all of those players and coaches opened up, which I think is a good thing for us. Uh, but we weren't happy about seeing that league not make it. But because of that, didn't there have to be some happiness and satisfaction? I mean, the fact is you're going to have to get, if the, you couldn't break through that legal barrier, you're going to have to get an, an entire other league's worth of roster. Roster, you know. That's true, but think about the numbers. Folks, I think, kind of forget. So an NFL team goes to camp, let's say, early August with 90 guys on the roster. 
and then they cut down uh, to 53 come September 1st, September 2nd. That's a pretty good size cut. One fell swoop, right? Nowadays, the Turk is very busy that particular day, you know, going around and, 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 uh, and cutting these guys. You know, there, there are literally hundreds of players who are available uh, at that point in early September. Some of those guys cycle back through, of course, because of injury and because they're the, you know, the next offensive lineman that the team's going to sign when, when somebody gets hurt. Uh, but there's literally four or 500 players that are available every year. And some of those guys are the same guys, right, who go through that cycle constantly. But there's a lot of talented football players out there. We believe, even with the AAF, had they survived, that there are enough quality players to make the league, make our league work. Would the cautionary tale about the alliance that they did not have their funding correct and their business structure, or was it that they gave too much control to a guy like Tom Dundon that could pull the plug before anybody else wanted to? Great question. I'm not sure I know the specifics about you know Dundon's obligations and his you know the rights that he held when he came in and, and pledged uh, you know his financial commitment. Uh, but clearly, I think the the funding wasn't sorted out. We can just say that. And secondly, I think they did didn't have enough time. They just just didn't have enough time to establish the franchises in their in the local markets to sell tickets to get local sponsorships. I think I read somewhere where they had literally one league sponsor. And then, you know, I think anybody in the sports business realizes that you need to have, uh, you know, a much more robust, right, league sponsorship uh, program as well as at the team level. So I think at the end of the day, it was time and money. And those two, those two things are indispensable for success. Oliver Luck, CEO of the XFL, joins us here on the show. So because we were so emotionally connected with the Alliance, we obviously were searching for reasons that it ended. And one of the reasons that we have bandied about here is that perhaps Vince McMahon had a deal with Tom Dundon and said, you know what, end this, pull the plug, it's over. What do you think? I highly doubt that. <laughs> I can't add, add, speak for Vince, of course, uh, but I, I'd be surprised if uh, if there was any sort of backdoor uh, relationship that the two have. Uh, Dundon's a successful business person, I think made a bunch of money in uh, Texas with uh, you know, low-cost automobile loans, et cetera. Uh, you know, Vince operates in a much different space with with WWE, publicly traded company. So I I really can't you know confirm or deny there was any contact between those two gentlemen. What about the type of football you want to play? Because the alliance had a few wrinkles, but it stayed pretty true to what we know about football. Well, the XFL, the first iteration was kind of a wacky version of the NFL. A wacky version of football. What about this version? So this version, we want to, number one, avoid gimmicks. And I think there were some gimmicks. Seriously, back in 2001, I'd be the first to acknowledge that. We want to have an up-tempo, fast-paced game. We want to have, you know, 75, 80 plays per team, a little bit higher than what the NFL has. We want it all done in three hours, <laughs> you know, because we think that one of the complaints we've heard from folks is that, you know, these games last a little bit too long. And the and pace of the time. Alliance was the best thing they had going for them. Oh, they, had good pace. They, they had good pace. They we're, we're looking at a 30-second clock. Uh, we're looking at a running clock during the first quarter and up until the you know, two minutes uh, left in each of the halves. And we've tested all this stuff. We've got a different kickoff. We've got a different... Uh, uh, overtime system that uh, we really like. We're working with our broadcast partners to sort of figure out a lot of the specifics about that. So we want an up-tempo, fast-paced, fun, exciting game with a couple of twists. Vince asked me to reimagine the game. It was a great opportunity to do that as a football fan. Who wouldn't like to do that, right? Uh, but at the same time, I said to myself, you know, professional football, the NFL level, college football, major colleges, the five big conferences, it's at a pretty good level right now. I think football is being played as well as it's ever been played. I'm amazed by the talented athletes and the great catches and the great tackles and the great moves and the great throws that you see every Sunday and every Saturday. So we didn't have to do much to really improve the game, but we think we've got about a dozen innovations that we think will help the game and we think fans will find very interesting and compelling. How are the broadcast partners going to break down? When will we games will have, be played? What television networks? Yeah, so we will have uh, two major broadcast partners. we got four games every weekend, of course, eight-team league, and we'll have two of those games basically every weekend on terrestrial over-the-air coverage, then we'll have the addition, uh, the remaining two on a fully distributed cable uh, network or networks. So uh, brands that everybody recognizes, we'll announce those relatively soon. We... Uh, think that's great exposure for us and really we're, we're putting visibility at a much higher level than we are for example tech and, and streaming right? those are all important those are coming right the young people <laughs> love all that stuff but for us we believe that visibility on major networks is really crucial to make sure that we can kind of get over the hump and really get get established so uh, we're excited about that 
Uh, there'll be Saturday, Sunday games. Right? We may have, towards the end of the season, a couple of Thursday evening games. We're going to sort of experiment with that. Uh, but we want to be traditional Saturday, Sunday, which is the time that diehard, passionate football fans like you and I want to watch football. So I think that's interesting because I would agree the visibility on a national scale is so important. One of the problems, though, with the Alliance seemingly in a lot of local markets was they didn't do enough internal promotion within those markets to get people out to games. The attendance started to sag really outside of San Antonio and Orlando. How much stress, influence, emphasis will you put on the in-game experience for fans to go out there in those markets? Uh, a ton of exp uh, a ton of emphasis on the in-game experience. And if you've you know, been to a WWE event, I think you realize you know how important that that experience is. I spent ten years in Europe and with NFL Europe, and, and the game day experience was crucial because you want people to come in and uh, not just enjoy the game, the, the the play on the field, but have an enjoyable time, right? Buy a hot dog, a Coke, reasonable prices, listen to some good music, some nice entertainment. You want a, a good, well-rounded sort of day. So that's going to be very, very important for us. And that's a lot of work, right? That's another thing where you simply need time to kind of prepare your 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 schedule for a game day, how it operates, what it looks like, who the guests are, how it works. Those are all issues that you just can't turn around from one day to the next. The XFL will debut the weekend after the Super Bowl next year? Correct, February 8th, Saturday. February 8th, 2020, the XFL comes, and they've announced five of the eight head coaches, right? That's correct. So this upcoming week will be St. Louis, you said? Well, during St. Louis on Thursday, and then uh, more than likely uh, before the end of the month uh, at L.A., our coach out in Los Angeles, and then we've got one one left, which is in Houston. So keep an eye out for all of those hires and those announcements and the XFL working towards spring of 2020 for their debut. Oliver Luck at the head of this joining us here on the show. You know, obviously we still have a very raw wound, but as it heals, perhaps we'll come by and uh, hang out. We'll have a drink with you guys. We will put, uh, what do they say, salve in the wound? No salt, <laughs> just salve. Yeah, okay. So we uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> we won't let you down. <laughs> Thank you. We don't need that again. Oliver Luck <laughs> joining us here on the show.